Moving on, today, how do I take a step of faith? Part two. Part two, how do we take a step of faith? Why do we feel jealous? Why are so many people greedy? What gives us over to outbursts of anger and harsh words toward others? Why do we hurt the ones we say we love? Why do we push others aside to get ahead ourselves? Why can't we forgive when someone does something wrong to us? Self-control, it eludes so many of us, especially when we're in front of butter tarts. Why does self-control elude so many of us? We overeat, we eat what isn't good for us, we drink too much, or we indulge in anything that makes us feel better. Our minds are set on feeling better. We fantasize about that which we believe will make us happy to avoid the pain in life and to feel alive. You know what? If I ever followed through on some of the things that I think, some of the desires that rage inside me, people would think I'm a monster. I could even go to jail for some of the things that I think of. But don't be shocked. You're thinking the same things. Why aren't we fulfilled in our relationships? What's missing? How many of us have thought, well, if only my partner was like... To ourselves, we often think, if only I had... And where is this joy and peace and life that Jesus talks about and the disciples seemed to have experienced? Oh, well, the answer is faith. Trust in God. But how do I take that step of faith? Last week, we looked at some of the stories that illustrated how to take a step of faith. Being in touch with our deep longings and our dignity. We talked about why we don't take such steps of faith. Because it hurts. Because it's not easy. Because no one wants to die to self. Control is our spiritual disposition. We refuse to trust God can and will fulfill us more than what we have set our desires upon. I will not forgive because I don't believe God will defend my dignity. I will not share or give because I don't believe God will provide. I want to provide for myself so I can get what I want and satisfy myself. I will create value for myself by proving others wrong, by pointing out the faults of others, by gossiping, by telling others about the negative things in someone else. This makes us feel better about ourselves because we do not believe God really values us. I don't believe God loves me. Therefore, I feel insecure and will manipulate others into liking me. We become demanding in our relationships. We use them to feel better about ourselves. We love with conditions. We use others to feel better about ourselves. The respect that I get from that job will make me feel better because I do not believe God is interested in me. God doesn't love me, so I need the praise of others. All of these feelings, these emotions and thoughts, they all rise from one thing, unbelief. The soul is thirsty, and we attempt to satiate it in any way we possibly can, all from unbelief. Hmm. Yet the truth is that thirst can only be satiated by God. Hmm. That's exactly what we do not believe. And because we are unbelievers, all this evil comes out from within us. 
Sure, we can believe that there is a God. We may even believe all of the right doctrines, but that is not trust. That kind of belief is not faith. As Professor Morris in the New Bible Dictionary says, faith is not accepting certain things as true, but trusting in a person, and that person is Christ. I'll read that one more time. Faith is not accepting certain things as true, but trusting a person, and that person is Christ. All the ways that we hurt each other come from within, from our unbelief. And this is what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 12, 35, a good person brings good things out of the good stored up in them, and an evil person brings evil things out of the evil stored up in them. Hmm. Every single action, every single thought, every single desire is determined by our faith or our unbelief. Every single one of them. Sin is unbelief. Millard Erickson in Christian Theology says, I submit that sin is unbelief. Once again, we are here, faced with terms, talking concepts, and we'll look at one more concept before turning to some practical ways we sin and therefore reveal practical ways in which we can take steps of faith. So some of you will remember our series on sin that we did two years ago. How many remember that? All right. <laughs> Good thing I'm going to review it. <laughs> Maybe we should redo that series. What do you think? <laughs> A few more hands will go up next time I ask that question. We examined what sin is. We even had the same quote from Millard Erickson that we just read, that sin is unbelief. Unbelief is the antithesis to trust. Unbelief manifests itself as selfishness. Trust, otherwise translated as faith and belief, manifests as love. Unbelief, selfishness. Trust, love. Here's a brief summary of what sin is in order to help us understand how the practical steps of faith applied to our lives. What is sin? What is unbelief? Well, there are a few words in the New Testament Greek that are translated into English as sin. However, the word to describe the nature of sin and the universality of sin in the human condition is hamartia. Do you remember what that word hamartia means? Yes. To miss the mark, exactly. It's an illustration from archery, right? Hamartia is one takes a bone and arrow and shoots for the target but misses. Pew. Hmm, okay. How does that describe or illustrate the spiritual condition of sin? Right? How? What does sin have to do with shooting bows and arrows? For many people who've grown up in the church, they've heard that sin, hamartia, means to miss the mark. And it's improperly taught that to hit the mark means to do the right thing. How many have heard that before? To hit the mark means to do the right thing, right? We choose to follow the rules, and when confronted with, say, greed, we decide to do the right thing, and we share. Boom, hit the mark. When tempted to commit adultery, we decide not to. Boom, hit the mark. But this is not what hit the mark means at all. If hitting the mark meant choosing to do the right thing, then we don't need a savior. We can be righteous on our own. If hitting the mark meant doing the right thing, we are not saved by faith. And according to the Bible, even when we choose to do the right thing, we sin. The Pharisees and the religious leaders, they were great at following the law, choosing the right things. They didn't commit adultery. They made their sacrifices. They went to the temple. They avoided sinful behavior, were model citizens. Yet Jesus said that they were the children of hell in Matthew 23, 15. Wow. So let it be clear to hit the mark does not mean to choose to do the right thing. 
To miss the mark means to not trust God with our deepest longings and dignity. Let's go back to hamartia, the nature of sin, the bow and arrow missing the target. The target is God. The arrows are our desires. And the bow is our faith, where we aim and how we shoot our arrows. God is the target, is the source of our completeness, our fulfillment, our joy, our peace, our ability to love. If I aim my desire at something else other than God, no matter how many times I hit another target, I lose connection with God, I am no longer complete, I need to find joy, peace, and love from other things. So we see another person and think, ooh, that can make me feel better. But they can't take the place of God. We shoot our arrows of desire at another person and think, they can make me feel better. But they cannot make us, they cannot take the place of God. We shoot our arrows of desire and dignity at another person, not God. That is hamartia. It is not about choosing the right thing. It's about where we place our longing. And as we look to another person to fulfill us, it is impossible to love without conditions because we need that other person to fulfill us. Love breaks down. We cannot love without conditions. This is idolatry. To put something in the place of God, to change that target with our longings and desires, that is what idolatry is is. The relationship begins to break down as we realize that that individual or people or persons or group is not fulfilling us. So then what do we do? We become demanding, don't we? We demand that others do what we want. We demand that others act like we want. We demand that others behave how we want. Or we manipulate them into becoming what we want or being who we want or who we believe will make us happy, control other people. All of our motives are selfish. Sometimes we lash out at them. We blame the other person for their failure to make us feel better, even push them down to make ourselves feel better. All of this because we have aimed our arrows of desire at another person rather than God. Some begin to fantasize about what it would be like to be with someone other than their partner, thinking, well, maybe someone else will fulfill me. And they may step out of the relationship and try another person while still in the relationship or outside of relationship. Understand this. We're all designed for relationships, for long-term commitment to each other. But you know what? Even the good things that God creates for us become the idols in our lives. Wow. Remember Abraham and his son. Isaac was a gift to Abraham. Yet God tested him. Has Isaac replaced me, Abraham? Even the good things that God gives into our lives can become our idols. We need to take that step of faith and trust that God knows our deepest longings. Trust that fulfillment is found in God and nowhere else. What do you believe will make you feel fulfilled? What are your deepest longings? Do you remember last week we talked about Abraham? His deepest longing was to have a son. We talked about Moses, who had all the riches and prestige of Egypt. And we talked about Jesus, who was crowned king by the people and had a wonderful, successful ministry. To take that step of faith is to die to our deepest longings. Stop believing in them to make you happy. That's how we put God back on the throne of our heart. And it will hurt. You won't want to. But that means you found an idol in your life. Hmm. See, those are the areas of which you need to take a step of faith. You know what? Idolatry has many forms, and it's different for every one of us. 
We need love from another person. We need respect from other people. We need to feel important about ourselves. We need money or we need a position of authority. Oh, money. That's a good one, isn't it? Ah, yeah. First Timothy 6.10 says this about money. It says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. <laughs> For you, how many is that your favorite verse in the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> Got that pinned up at the fridge at home, don't you? Why? Why is the love of money a root of all kinds of evil? Because we use money to self-fulfill. That's why. There's nothing wrong with money. It's just a tool. It doesn't say that money is the root of all kinds of evil. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. There's a big difference there. Don't blame the money. Out of the heart come all these issues, Jesus said. It's not the money. Don't blame the money. So if you need to get rid of it, just give it to me. I'll hang on to it for you. <laughs> Glad you're laughing. You know I'm kidding. Why would anyone love money? Because we use it to fill our desires. We've taken our arrows of desire and dignity and we moved them away from God and aimed it at money. People will respect me if I have money. I will feel important if I have money. I can buy whatever makes me happy with money. The reason that money tends to make people proud is because they are using it to establish their dignity. Money makes them feel important rather than the fact that we are loved by God. There's nothing wrong with money. It becomes wrong when we aim our arrows of desire and dignity at money to fulfill us. There's nothing wrong with relationships. But even in our marriages, we can become idolatrous. Imagine that. Imagine that. Our partners can become I our idols. We look to them for fulfillment instead of God. And when our partner doesn't fulfill us, we look to others. We either fantasize or we actually engage. You know what? It makes no difference. Whether we do or we don't, it's all unbelief. Hmm. Even if we don't, it's still hamartia. Why? Because it's born from within. That's why Jesus said we are guilty of adultery even before we commit the act. That's a pretty big deal, isn't it? If you think it, you're guilty. Wow, that's a big deal. Any target other than God is an idol. The idol is that which we believe will make us happy, feel fulfilled, feel good about ourselves, apart from God. And we all do it. Every single one of us. There isn't one of us who doesn't do this. If you want to know what your idols are, consider what you fantasize about. Think about that for a minute. What do you fantasize about? Hmm? What roles around in your head over and over and over again. What do you fantasize about? If you won the lottery, what would you be doing? What comes to mind? Hmm? These are your idols. Why do you want them? What deep longing are they fulfilling? And idolatry is aiming our arrows of desire and dignity at anything other than God. That's what it is. Millard Erickson on sin in Christian theology again says, idolatry in any form is the essence of sin. Idolatry in any form is the essence of sin. Why? Because idolatry, God, I don't believe you are enough to fulfill me. I will aim my longings at something else. Hamartia. That's exactly what's happening there. And that's why the first commandment is to have no other gods before God. Anything. Hmm. How do we have a God other than God? It's by aiming those arrows of desire and dignity away from God. We're all idolaters at heart, aren't we? Aren't we? Every single one of us. God didn't make that first commandment to have no other gods before him because of a need to be number one, but from a recognition that if we turn to anything other than God for fulfillment we will come to harm. Hurt, pain, loss of joy, 
unmet deep longings and suffering, the inability to love one another. The commandment is meant to keep us from harm, not to fulfill some insecure feeling on God's part to be number one. W. Gunther, in the New International Dictionary of the New Testament Theology, emphasizes this when he says, Sin is an estrangement from God and thus brings harm and punishment upon itself. Wow. God's not punishing, punishing me. The devil isn't punishing me. It's just the consequences of our disconnection from God. Hmm. Consider the sin of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness says, I don't believe God will defend my dignity, therefore I will do it myself. That's why unforgiveness springs from hamartia. We become the defenders of our dignity. We don't believe God is just. We don't believe God will defend our dignity. God is not asking us to ignore injustice or to push down our hurt and pain, but to give it to Him and trust that God sees the injustice. Forgiveness is to believe God is just. And that's not to say we abandon justice here. On the contrary, Jesus calls us to stand up for injustice and the wrongs done to us. But we can do that in freedom of spirit and in power and in love, not vengeance, which is an expression of unbelief. That's why God says in Romans 12, 9, it's mine to avenge, I will repay. It's mine to revenge, I will repay. You stand up for injustice, but do it in freedom and spirit of love. Forgiveness is a step of faith. It hurts, it's death to self. It's not easy. But I have already warned you, faith is not easy right? Have you heard me say that before? Yeah. Faith is not easy. I hope and pray that you never find yourself in that place where you need to forgive. It's so difficult. That's why Jesus in the Lord's Prayer says, Father, do not lead us into testing, into temptation, don't lead us into that place that is so hard to take a step of faith. Hmm. Unforgiveness is the fruit of unbelief. We don't believe. Another subtle area in our lives of unbelief is found in our very relationship with God. Even our relationship with God has become self-serving. And just as we look to others to make us happy, we look to God in the same way. We ask God to give us what we want instead of wanting God above all else. Do you get that? We ask God to give us what we want instead of wanting God above all else. Larry Crabb, in his book Shattered Dreams, illustrates this perfectly when he tells this story. A woman told me with a peaceful smile that she knows God will bring her deserting husband back to her. When I asked her the reason for the hope within her, she smiled even more broadly and replied, He promised me an abundant life. Hmm. She has it wrong. She believes her abundant life is in getting what she wants, not in God alone. She's using God to get what she wants. Her idol is an ideal marriage, and God is a convenient way to get what she wants. Do you see that? See how subtle that is? Hmm. Again, Larry Crabb sums this up nicely in his book, Soul Talk, when he says, only God has the love we need, yet we turn away from him, except to demand convenient instructions, or cooperative help. So we manage every relational encounter with self-need as our ultimate value. Wow, doesn't that perfectly describe us? Isn't that amazing? Hmm. It's not that we can't ask God for things. It's not that we can't ask God for restoration in our relationships. 
And it doesn't mean that we can't ask God for good things in this life. God encourages us to ask. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Well, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Right? So this isn't about not asking, well, I can't ask God for anything. No! Ask! Ask! But note that Jesus talks about good gifts to those who ask. Compare this to what James in chapter 4 of his letter says. James chapter 4 says this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask God, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Wow. James has got it down right too, doesn't he? You see, that woman was asking God with the wrong motives. She believed abundant life was found in getting what she believed would make her happy. That poor man. No wonder he ran away. <laughs> My wife is saying, you should not have said that. <laughs> it can work the other way around. It can work the other way around. I'm not getting out of it, am I? No. <laughs> what was happening there? She was using the relationship to fulfill herself. Wow. Wow. Or he was using the relationship to fulfill himself. Is that better? Works both ways. Works both ways. Hmm. Her arrows of desire were not aimed at God. And she was sinning. She was hamartia. Yeah, it wasn't an explicit outward sign, outward typical fruit of sin. You couldn't see it, but God knows the heart and he sees that. And that's what was happening. It was hamartia. To take steps of faith, we must recognize when and how we are aiming at something other than God for fulfillment. Unforgiveness, manipulation, lashing out, blaming others, greed, fear, jealousy, gossip, tearing others down to make ourselves feel a lot better. How else do we do it? We do it by self-fulfillment by any pleasures that we find in this life. Food, entertainment, sex, prestige, vanity, selfish ambition. The many desperate attempts to quench that thirst inside. We need to examine the idols in our lives. That's where you need to take your steps of faith. Let them go. Don't believe in them. Believe in God. Trust that God, beyond any pleasures in this world, is greater than that. One day, I said to God, I said, God, it's not fair. It's not fair. Faith is too difficult, and it's your fault. You made such a wonderful world. The pleasures of this world are amazing, God, and it's your fault that I don't believe because you made the world so amazing. And that's when the Spirit whispered back, well then, if you think that's so amazing, you can't even imagine how much more amazing I am. So try me. The Spirit of God dares us to believe. And as we looked at those stories last week, we do recognize it's not easy to believe. But when we do, we discover it's worth it. Amen. Let's pray. God, give us the courage to believe. Yeah, the world truly is amazing. It's wonderful. The, the joys that you have created for us are wonderful, but you are even greater than those. Help us to believe that. Give us a vision of that, that we would be brave and have courage to take those real steps of faith. And in the meantime, as we're working up our courage, Give us grace and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. I'd like to invite the band.